could generate all the others. Like there's no culprits for it. It's not like, it's not like this rot red rotation and this red rotation hoop are the two independent ones. Yes, those are independent, but you could take any two and simultaneously rotate them to get all the others, okay, with different magnitudes. So for instance, let me, um, let me, well here, actually, let me show you something interesting here, okay? Oops. Okay, so, let's just draw in from the other one, okay? So, so you could imagine, um, so, you know, say you have a, a block here, okay, and I said it had this degree of freedom, the translation and a rotation. That was, say a red rotation line was coming out at you, okay? So it could, it could rotate like this and it could also translate up, okay? Well, say I, say I rotated it a lot and moved it up just a little bit. So say it rotated like that and I rotated a lot and moved it up just a little bit. Well, that's, that would behave as if it was actually rotating around this line. You see, if it rotated around that line, it would move up like that. Okay, well, say I rotated a little bit, but moved it up a lot. Okay, so rotate a little bit, moved up a lot. Well, now this is as if it rotated out here. So see, it's like moved up there. So just by doing different amounts of rotation and translation, you can get every single red rotation coming out at you on that plane. Okay? So, um, and, it, you know, you could imagine if you, um, you know, how, how could you get the translation from two rotations? Well, you could imagine um, if, if I have two rotations like this coming out at you and I both rotate them in the opposite direction, then everything in the middle would translate up, right? If I rotate them both the same direction, then it would be like a rotation in between that's rotating. If I rotate this and this the same amount in the same direction at the same time, it would, whatever the object would be, would rotate as if it was rotating about an axis in the middle. And if you do them different amounts and different rates, you can get all the other rotations on the plane. Okay, so, so hopefully you can see how if I take any two of these, the translation, any one red one, or any two red ones, by linearly combining them, giving them different magnitudes of rotation or translation, you can make the system rotate around any of them. Okay, so there's no two special independent ones, but you know, any two can be independent. These two just happen to be the ones our brain finds and that correspond with modal analysis. Okay? Um, but those aren't, those are degrees of freedom, but they don't necessarily have to be the culprit degrees of freedom. Any two of these could be considered an independent degree of freedom. Okay. So, but the important thing is this is one of the freedom spaces, okay? So we've come up with a new freedom space. Before we've done disks, and sometimes disks combine, two disks combine, and we know we know a disk of translations has two independent things in it, and just memorize that. You know a disk of two in, of, of uh, rotations has two independent uh, things in it. Remember that. Okay, and now we have a plane of red rotation lines with a translation. That has two things in it as well. Now I could have just not drawn the hoop and just drawn the arrow, or I could have just not drawn the arrow and drawn the hoop. They're the same thing. So I start, you'll see later on, I start drawing freedom space without the hoops because they just kind of look ugly. I just have the translations in there. It's the same information, right? The hoop and the black arrow are the same thing. You can draw one or the other, or both if you want, you know? Okay, but that's a freedom space. And remember, it's location orientation on the body matter, okay? So now, let's look at a new design. So I have you, again, build this. If you were in class with me here, um, I'd give you your flexor kits and you'd, you'd build these. Okay, again, and let me show you how this works. Um, has the same two intersecting things on a back plane right there, and these two hard angled things, okay? And uh, I'd say, how many degrees of freedom does it have? Well, um, there, it's, it's exactly constrained, so six minus, there's four wires, so six minus four is two, you know there's two, so let's see if you can find the two, okay? Um, and if you were to make this, okay, it would look like this, okay? Here's, here's the two angled ones in the back, those two right here are these two. Okay, and here's the two hard angled ones, okay? So if you play with it, the obvious one is this like diving board. Like immediately when you touch it, it's like, okay, that's very compliant. And you could think, well, that's, that's this line through here, right? This line through, right through there, okay? This line through there 
would be a line that intersects this guy here, those two guys there, and this guy there would be a line right through there, and that's the rotation. So it follows the rule of concrete patterns. That's one of them. Okay, you know you have to at least find two because it's six minus four is two. So where is the other one? Well, that's the weird one. So if you grab this and play with it, oh, this is going to came out here. If you grab this and play with it, see if you can see that, okay, it gets this really weird, okay, rotation. It's very unpleasant for our brains, okay? Um, if you play with that, I mean, it's, it's a very clear degree of freedom, but it's not clear what axis it's rotating around, okay? Like, you, you definitely grab it, you know it's a rotation, but it's definitely an axis that's not perpendicular to any of the, uh, you know, edges of, of the, the stage, okay? It's something weird, okay? Well, you can find out exactly what it is where your brain probably can't. You can find out using the rule of complement patterns. It would be a red line back through here, okay, that, that is uh, parallel to these two guys, but intersects these two guys at that point. So let me show you. If you do a modal analysis... Okay, you find out that it's this. Here's the diving board one on the left, and here's the other weird one that is, uh, you know, this, this line is parallel to those two, but intersects those two right up there, okay? And so you can see that's a very unpleasant rotation, but that's how it rotates. It's just it's, your brain doesn't like it because this red line isn't perpendicular to any of these surfaces, okay? But it is indeed the degree of freedom, Okay. Okay, so that's the two degrees of freedom, but, um, or at least, you know, we found two independent things, and those are the two, notice they're orthogonal, this and that are orthogonal. Um, they happen to be the two mode shapes, that's what our brain finds, that's what we seem to find first, even using the rule of complement patterns, it's kind of magic, we, our brains are wired to have orthogonal perpendicularity, you know, we identify that. But, right, it's two degrees of freedom, and so as long as you have two or more degrees of freedom, you have infinite other motions. So can you find an infinite number of other red lines that satisfy the condition? Well, sure you can. They're, they're there. Let me ask you this. Do these two red lines intersect each other? Yes, they do. They're not only perpendicular, but they intersect each other at this point where these two guys meet. Okay, and what happens when you have two intersecting red lines? Well, remember that, uh, remember this example back uh, here? Two intersecting red lines gets a whole disk. Because you can linearly combine, simultaneously rotate these different amounts and you'll get everything in that disk. Okay, so sure enough, the answer here is those two will generate a disk that lies on the plane of these two guys, but is centered, at the, the point of the, the center of the disk is where those two guys intersect, okay? And sure enough, you can see every red line in that disk will intersect these two guys at the point where they intersect and these two guys because they'll either be parallel to or intersect those because they're on the same plane, okay? And sure enough, if you got to play with this model, you would see you could rotate it fairly easily about all those, do, you know, rotations, not just the two orthogonal one. And so, so here we find, you know, here's another freedom space. But remember... For this system, it, it's not, you need not only to know it's a disk, but you need to know how it's lo where it's located and how it's oriented, okay, to be the freedom space of it. And, and it's not just the orthogonal ones are independent, any two are independent, okay? So, so far, we've seen disks of translations, there's two in there, disks of rotations, there's two in there, and planes of parallel red lines with a translation perpendicular to it, there's two in there, okay? So, memorize those. If you memorize these... Uh, you know, it might not seem valuable now, but they'll, they'll save you a lot of time on exams and stuff. Okay, the third, um, the third one, okay, is, um, is uh, this guy. And uh, you can see, you know, if you rotate it here, you have two vertical ones and then two angled ones, okay, like that. And let me show you uh, this one built. Okay. Okay, so here we have this one's right like here. So here's your two vertical ones, and here's your two angled ones. Let's see if I hold it this way, it corresponds to that image. Here these guys are uh well let's see here. How would it for you? Yes, these are angled back, those are angled back. So this this corresponds with the picture better. 
okay? Um, and again, you know, six minus four is two, you know, there's at least two degrees of freedom. Um, and they are two degrees of freedom, it's exactly constrained. Can you find the red lines that, that satisfy it? Well, you know, you play with it and immediately you get this weird rotation. Again, it's some rotation that's obviously not perpendicular to any of these faces. Um, and you think about it, that would be the rotation pretty much here. It's on the plane of the two, of the two uh, vertical ones but it's parallel to these two angled ones. So something like that, and as you rotate it, you can definitely see and feel that you're getting some weird rotation there. Okay, so that's one of them. The other thing is you can see it can translate in the direction perpendicular to all these. And of course, you know, one way you can find translations, you know, is um, if you don't want to use the rule of comparing patterns, just a quick side thing, is if you think about it, you can translate in any direction perpendicular to a wire. So you can think of like a disk of translations, a black disk of translation arrows, perpendicular to each of these wires. And uh, when you put them all in parallel, you find which direction do they all have in common? What arrow is, from all of them, all four of them, all of the four of the disks, um, is, is, is all shared in the same direction? And the, the answer is in this direction. You know, perpendicular in that way, perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular. This translation, is perpendicular to all of them. Okay, whoops, this looks like this came out here. Okay, so that's one way to find the translation, but your brain finds it pretty quick just by playing with it. Goes in this direction. Um, now, how could you find the, let's use the rule of complementary patterns. No, not that just new rule I, I taught you. Um, <clears throat> what you do is, is, can you find a red line that intersects all four of these guys somewhere at least once? Well, if you think about it, there's one plane here these two guys lie on a plane here, and then this guy lies on a plane here, so that we have three parallel planes with blue lines on them. This one has one on it, this one has one on it, and this one has two on it. Okay, but there's three parallel planes there. If you look down on it, it's like three parallel planes, one there, one there, one there. And you can imagine, since they're all parallel in this direction, okay, they would all intersect a hoop out this way. Okay, so a, a red hoop Okay, with an infinite uh, a circle with an infinite radius, um, right? That that is a line that that intersects every blue line on this plane, every blue line on this plane, and every blue line on this plane. Remember, no matter how many planes you stack up, if they're all parallel, they all intersect the same line with the same hoop from that projective geometry example. So, and of course, if you have a hoop there, the direction is perpendicular to. If you imagine rotating, is this translation? So, okay, so. Um, so uh, if you want to look at um, the mode shapes, these are the ones you find um, if you do modal analysis, right? Um, those are the ones that, uh, uh, again, are the, you know, the furthest apart, 90 degree angles, okay? You can see they're both perpendicular. We have this, on the right, you have the cockeyed uh, rotation that's off at a weird angle there. Uh, not perpendicular to the stage of anything else, okay? And then you have um, you have the translation, which is in a direction perpendicular to that rotation. So again, modal analysis found the perpendicular ones that are furthest apart from each other, and uh, that's what your brain also found. Um, but again, even though your brain found those two degrees of freedom, the system does have two degrees of freedom, it also has an infinite number of other permissible motions. So the question is, can you find um, all the other lines that satisfy the rule of comparing patterns? Because there's an infinite number of them. And sure enough, here I'll hold this up like this. Um, sure enough, uh, right, this was the rotation you got, right? It's, it's like uh, on the plane of these two vertical ones, angled, or sorry, angled in the direction of parallel to these two guys. So like, it's like this, right? It's, it's on this back plane here. Okay, like that. Um, but if you move it just over, as long as you keep it parallel to these guys, but it's on the plane of those guys, it will work. Okay, and you can see that here. Okay, so you can see every single red line on the plane of the two vertical ones that's angled with the angle of the same angle of these will intersect all of them on this plane and be parallel to those two. 
So it'll work, including the hoop. And we've already seen this. This was the same freedom space from before. Uh, again, this is infinite plane of all parallel lines and the translation perpendicular to that plane. Okay, And the, the hoop is contained within this infinite space, so there's two independent things. So I gave this example to show you that there can be systems that uh, look totally different. You know, this system looks very different than the other. It's a different topology. It's got, uh, sure, it's got four wires, but they're all located and oriented differently. Um, and it even feels like it moves different. The two degrees of freedom your brain finds um, are very different. This one was angled and in a middle plane. And uh, the other example was, you know, if you go back here, um, this was a nice, clean rotation, just vertical, and the plane was on the front face. Okay, so it, that manifests as it feeling like it had a completely different set of degrees of freedom, but they both have the same freedom space. Okay, the difference is the reason your brain perceived it as totally different is because it was located and oriented in a very different place on the mechanism. Okay, so sometimes mechanisms look totally different, but they're the exact same freedom space. They're just l located and oriented differently. Okay, all right, so final, final example here um, for freedom spaces is this one, okay? So say um, I told you to build this one. This one's a little easier to build. Okay, I won't stand up on the table. I can just hold this up, okay? Here's, here's the thing with the four vertical wires, okay? You can say, how many degrees of freedom does this have? Well, um, you know, six minus four is two. It has to at least have two, but what if this one's not exactly constrained? And I'll give you a hint. It's not. Uh, this is over constrained. There is a redundant constraint. Okay. Well, first of all, can you visualize how this would move? Well, indeed, you can. And if you can't, you can trust me here. Well, here, I'll stand on the thing again here. Okay. So you, when you play with it, you get a nice rotation. So they both rotate here, if you can see that. And then you get a translation in this direction, you get a translation in this direction. Okay. You, you can't rotate it about this axis, or it'll cause these to stretch or compress. You can't rotate around this axis. You can rotate there. Okay, you can't translate there. It'll cause them all to stretch or compress. And you can uh, translate there and there. Okay, so one, two, three degrees of freedom. So that you could kind of find from common sense. This one's a little easier because everything's perpendicular and nice. Um, and you can visualize it. Um, and you could do modal analysis even after you play with them and you find, okay, here's the first, you know, here's, here's the uh, first uh, natural frequencies or, or this translation, that translation, this rotation, okay? And then the fourth natural frequency is much higher and corresponds with the mode shape that is, is constrained, okay? So, and again, notice they're all orthogonal. This rotation is orthogonal to that translation, which is orthogonal to that translation. Okay, so again, the mode shapes, the things your brain finds, they can visualize, are nice orthogonal features, which is why, by the way, engineers used to use this Cartesian coordinate thing with the three orthogonal, er, three orthogonal rotations, three orthogonal translations I've talked about in the last lecture. That's really just kind of false, right, to be honest. But, um, but um, okay, so, so, so we know there's three. Um, so going back, uh, again, let me ask you, is this, uh, so it's a parallel system. Is it over-constrained? Well, sure, because 6 minus 4 is 2, but there's 3, so you know 1 is redundant, so it's over-constrained. And sure enough, if you took this one out, or any of them, you know, you could ask yourself, which is the culprit here? Which one could be removed? Well, if you take any one out, it doesn't change the, the, the 3 degrees of freedom. It doesn't change the kinematics. So they're all the culprit in this case. Um, they could all be redundant. There's only one redundant one, but they could all be the, to blame, okay? Okay, so, but like, let's use the rule of complementary patterns. Like, obviously, first of all, does this hold with the rule of complementary patterns, these things we found? Well, um, okay, this, this rotation is indeed, if we can get this to stop rotating here, it, it is indeed parallel with all these blue lines, if we drew the uh, blue lines through the wires. It is parallel with them all, and so it intersects at infinity. So this one definitely follows the rule of complement patterns. What about this one? Well, oops, let's see. Okay, this one, okay, the, the translation here, I guess I'll stand up again. Okay, the translation in this direction, think about these two lie on a plane, and these two lie on a plane, and those two parallel planes intersect a hoop here that causes this translation. So there you go. 
And then these two lie on planes, and these two lie on planes, it makes a hoop in the other direction that translates in that direction. Okay? So sure enough, uh, those two red hoops do satisfy the rule of comfort independence. They will intersect all four of those blue lines somewhere at least once. Okay. Okay, so that works. But again, uh, this time we have three degrees of freedom, which means we, we we're definitely going to have a huge, sub, a huge set of infinite permissible motions. So can you find other red lines that satisfy the rule of complementary patterns, okay? Well, pretty much every red line in an infinitely large box will, that's parallel to these blue lines, these, these you know, wires, the axis of the wires, um, will work, right? They'll all intersect them at infinity. And, and you know, I, 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 I drew this box as if it ends at the stage where the stage ends, but it doesn't. You can imagine an infinitely large box that encompasses this entire stage and just every single red line, even red lines outside here, any red line anywhere in space that is parallel to these four guys will work because it'll intersect them at infinity. And you could rotate that stage around any of those red lines. Okay? Now, um, what about the translations? Can, can we, remember, if we have two translations that are pointing in, in, you know, in different directions, they linearly come in to make a disk of translations. So the two things can make a disk of translations, and where you locate that disk of translations is irrelevant because translations don't have locations. Um, it's just it, you have to orient them so they have the correct direction. So you can, get, you can translate this in any direction. Okay? But, but um, if we want to draw it in hoop land, you could draw them as like a beach ball of hoops. Anytime, see, you can think of um, this translation corresponds with a, with a circle that is on a plane that's perpendicular to it, just like this one. And if you think of every single arrow in that uh, disk and you, you found all the circles that were perpendicular to the direction, you'd find it would spin around and make like a beach ball of hoops at infinity. And that beach ball of hoops is, you know, if you take any single red line in this box, or this bundle of, of, of red perpendicular lines, and you pull them to infinity, it would make a hoop that's perpendicular to its corresponding translation. Okay, so, so any, if you have a single translation, it'll link to a single red hoop. If you have a disk of translations, that means two independent translations, you'll have a beach ball of red hoops. There's just infinite red hoops kind of spun on their axis here if the axis went through uh, the center of that disk there. Okay? That correspond, uh, and where each one of those corresponds to each arrow. Okay? So I draw this freedom space like this. Again, I, it's just ugly to draw beach balls, you know, and it starts getting ugly to draw hoops. So it's the same information to draw the arrows or the disk of arrows, and so I, I leave it at that. Okay? So, so there is the freedom space there. And this one, how many independent things are in this one, by the way? Well, three, right? Because um, remember, we decided there's three degrees of freedom. Three degrees of freedom is linearly combined to make this, this box, okay? So there's three independent wires in here. One's redundant. Six minus three is three. So there's three in this freedom space, okay? So, so again, let's review the things you should remember. If you have a disk of black arrows, there's two in there. Okay? If you have a disk of red, air, red rotations, there's two, two independent ones in there. If you have a plane of parallel red rotations in a perpendicular translation, two things are independent in that. Uh, two twists are independent in that, right? And then if you have a box of red rotation lines and a disk of black arrows, and there's, you know, you'll have both. You can't have them without each other. There's three independent ones in there. Okay? All right. All right, great. So, so there you go. So now you've memorized that. Um, okay, and you still don't know why you'd want to memorize these, but trust me, you're, you're halfway to being able to do my full design theory here. Okay? So let's do an exercise. Okay? First of all, consider um, uh, this, this example. Okay? Um, Again, say, you know, it's got these, it looks like uh, four wires coming off of it, and the backs of these are grounded. So uh, this is a parallel system. It's, of course, not under constraint because it's a parallel system. Um, I will tell you it is exactly constrained, okay? And so you know 6 minus uh, 4 is 2. You know you're looking for 2 degrees of freedom, which will make an infinite number of permissible motions. So 
Uh, I would I would recommend put the me on pause and see if you can use the rule of conformation patterns to find all the red lines that intersect all the blue lines if you were to draw the blue lines through the axes of these wires. Okay, so draw the blue lines and then find all the red lines and you should find an infinite number of them and uh, two of those should be independent. Okay, well, okay, if you did that, um, welcome back, <laughs> right? Um, let's, uh, uh, you know, the solution is this, okay? So every single red line in this disk will intersect this blue line there and will lie on the same plane as these three and therefore will intersect them or be parallel to any of them. You know, this red line intersects this one everywhere along its axis. It intersects this guy here and it's parallel to this guy, right? But just think about it. every single red line on this plane or in that disk will intersect these three guys somewhere at least once or be parallel to them which intersects them at infinity, okay? And, of course, you know a disk has two independent things in it, two independent twists, uh, red rotation twists with the pitches of zero in them. Two of them are independent. And um, uh, the mode shape of this would probably be this red line and this red line uh, because they're, there are two orthogonals with the two furthest ones away, orthogonal to the features and everything. Um, and, and that would be the one your brain would probably find. But, again, um, those aren't the two degrees of freedom necessarily. You could pick any two, okay? Okay, so that's freedom space. Freedom spaces are uh, just, um, they, are, they are a picture that shows you every way a system could move in a, in a glance, okay? And they're essentially the linear combination of the twists or degrees of freedom uh, that they, they represent. They, they show you all the combinations of the independent degrees of freedom. Um, all the permissible motions, okay? So now we're going to show a little bit of the math behind this, since you guys already know math from lecture two. Okay, this uses math from lecture two. Um, shouldn't be too intense if you understand that math, okay? Um, but I just want to show you how the math I taught in lecture two corresponds with freedom spaces, okay? Okay, so you already know that, um, that uh, you know, two orthogonal... Um, uh, rotations, uh, you already know that they linearly combine to make a disk. Because you've memorized that. I've, I've told you you trust me and everything. But say, say you didn't trust me. Say you wanted to mathematically prove that. Well, here's a, here's a way you could prove that uh, these two you know, trans rotations make a disk. Well, let's, let's uh, give them a coordinate system. You, you can get rid of the stage. It doesn't matter the shape of the stage. And let's say, you know, you have a, a coordinate system X, Y, and Z, and say this first rotation is on X and the second rotation is on Y, okay? And you know it's a twist with a pitch of zero. And this is a twist with a pitch of zero. So let's define it, okay? Uh, for twist one, you could find, um, uh, you know, the omega vector, the C vector, and the P, which is zero. You could combine them, you know, I'm not going to review that. And, and you would find your twist is this, okay, where its magnitude is omega one, okay? Well, your twist two would be this. If you do the same thing, find a C vector, and I recommend using zero, 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 okay? Um, and then this points in a certain direction, uh, and then the pitch is zero. You can make something like that, okay? So those are the two twists. Now, if you linearly combine them, what is linear combination means? It means you add them together. You know, here, here's, here's the two six by one vectors where each one corresponds to a twist, twist one, twist two. You add them with their magnitudes, and you allow the magnitude to be any real finite numbers. Okay, it can be any real finite numbers, and by linearly combining, that's what a, like you know you can look up on Wikipedia linear combination or anywhere, right? Um, if you get vectors and they, you times them by a scalar magnitude, add them together and allow those scalar magnitudes to be any real finite number, that's what you, that's what a linear combination is. Okay, that's how you're. Um, trying to, this is mathematically the way you cause this and this to rotate different amounts. You allow these to be any amount. This is big, it's a big rotation. If that's small, it's a small rotation there. And they linearly combine to get what they, they sum together to be is what you end up getting, okay? So if you leave this all symbolic, the linear combination of this is just omega 1, omega 2, and these are all zeros. So basically if you allow omega 1 and 2 to be anything, uh, then this represents the entire freedom space. That's why you say you see a twist FS, twist freedom space, is just, is this in one six by one vector, you, you know the freedom space of the entire thing mathematically. Okay? 
Well, let's interpret this mathematically, okay? Um, so if we break this into its omega and its v, you know, the top three, or its omega, 